Futurecast. This week on the Deep Leadership Podcast. If you really probe into broken printers, you realize you're not the outlier. This is a pain point that everyone has, that it's no one's job to fix, but making everyone's job worse. Do something about it. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is another beautiful day here in North Carolina, and I'm enjoying a hot cup of coffee from our friends at the Salty Sailor Coffee Company. Salty Sailor is a veteran-owned coffee brand and is the official coffee of the Deep Leadership Podcast. Listeners get 10% off their amazing selection of fresh roasted coffee by going to SaltySailorCoffee.com and entering the code DEEP at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to you by our other sponsors, Leader Connect, Ignite Management Services, and Liberty Strength. All these sponsors help me bring these shows to you each and every week, so I highly encourage you to click on their links below and check them out. In this episode of the Deep Leadership Podcast, I sit down with Charlie Gilkey, a U.S. Army veteran, business author, speaker, coach, and entrepreneur specializing in leadership, teamwork, and productivity. We discuss Charlie's latest book, Team Habits, which focuses on actions that can enhance team performance and results. We dove into topics such as decision-making, communication, planning, and other team habits that allow teams to get things done without always relying on management for direction. Most work in the modern world is done by teams, so leading teams and building team habits is an essential leadership skill. This was a powerful conversation. I know you'll enjoy. So are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Charlie Gilkey. Charlie is a U.S. Army veteran, business author, speaker, coach, and entrepreneur specializing in leadership, teamwork, and productivity. His latest book is called Team Habits, How Small Actions Lead to Extraordinary Results. In this book, Charlie identifies team habits that can improve team performance and transform your work life. Now, I'm excited to have him on the show to learn more about how to establish the right kind of team habits. So, Charlie, welcome to the show. John, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on the Deep Leadership Podcast. Hey, it's good to meet you and good to have you on the show. Um, and good to have another uh, uh, military veteran writing leadership books. I'm, I'm excited to have another veteran on the show. So, I yeah, thanks it. for that. We, we bring, a di- I think, a different um, tenor, but also a different intensity. I've, I've had people tell me. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And before we press record, we were telling stories about uh, the kind of books you like to read, the kind of books I like to read, and uh, a little bit of Army Navy back and forth. But uh, no, it's good, all good stuff and really glad to have you, uh, especially about uh, this idea of team habits, because I think it's a really important issue for leaders, uh, because nothing gets done without teams. And so establishing the right habits are really going to you know, have your organization perform. So, So first of all, what compelled you to write uh, a book about team habits. I think what most compelled me to write this book, well, there, there are two forces coming together at once. One is my last book, Start Finishing, was really about individual productivity and, and how do you focus on doing your best work. And before I started and finished that book, I knew it was a part of a three-book arc, or at least a three-book arc. So the first book was about how do you yourself get your best work done? The next logical book would be how do you get it done in the teams? And so I had it sort of bookended as start finishing together. Like that was his project name. And then the third book is what do leaders specifically need to do to help their teams do and finish their best work? So I knew going into this book writing thing that I had at least three books on my hand. And the other thing that came up is as I was giving book talks for start finishing, I'd have plenty of managers and leaders and executives say something along the lines of like, hey, these ideas are great. Like, can you get like upper management? Like, how do we get enrollment and buy-in from the senior leadership and upper management and like the C-suite to do some of these things? 
And John, it was always one of those things, given who I am, I'm like, so let me get this right. You're saying that amongst your team, you can't just implement some of this. You're telling me that you can't, as a team, find 90 minutes, three 90-minute blocks a week where individuals can go dark and work on something. That's impossible. Like you need senior management for that. And those managers would get kind of squeamish because they're kind of be like, well, we could. And what occurred to me was there was just this complete oversight and this overlooking of the power of teams and what we can do in teams where we don't need the full organizational buy-in. And really, I think most management and leadership literature gets it wrong in the sense where they place so much effort on individuals, whether those are individual, you know, frontline workers or individual managers, or individual executives to be the hero that changes the organization. And that's not the way it works. If that were the way that it worked, we wouldn't see really great performers and managers and leaders join a team and the team stay basically the same, right? We've all seen that happen. And we've also seen mediocre or poor performers enter a well-performing team And it ups their game. So really what I wanted to look at and talk more about was the power of building team workways and habits and focusing on that. And by team, for the rest of this conversation, I mean something pretty specific. I mean the four to eight people that you spend 80% of your time working with. Not your department, not your organization. Not the big company slogan that's like, we're all one team. I know what you mean, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the four to eight people that you spend most of the time working with. So for the remainder of this conversation, I'll assume that me and John and Taylor and Eric are all part of that team. In that team of John, Charlie, Taylor, and Eric, we can just do a lot of stuff without buy-in, without senior leadership direction without that. And if we focus on making our work lives together, those four people, we make 80% of our life better because those are the people we work with day in and out. Mm. And the last thing that I'll say on this one, John, is when we take team habits seriously, we realize that we're not just victims of work and bad work habits. We are participating in them. If John and I get on a meeting that stinks, We can look at each other in the eye and be like, you know what? It's just me and you. Why did we do that? Why was that so bad? Like, let's do better together. When you focus on team habits and focus on the power and the relationship that you have with each other. And again, it's four to eight people that you know that you generally like, or you can at least tolerate well enough to not make work suck. We have a surprising amount of really good work we can do. And work that we can do that makes our work lives easier, better, and more sustainable in the end. You know, what I like about what you're saying is like, don't wait for upper management to tell you how to how to run your team. Figure it out by yourself, right? Do what makes sense for the four to eight people that are part of your group, right? How do we as a team run successfully, regardless of the noise around us? Is that really what you're, st- you're getting down to? That's really what I'm getting down to. And, you know, John, you and I both have military exp- like experience and service. And the trick was always to get the furthest away from the flagpole as possible. Mm-hmm. Right. Because when you did a lot of whatever was happening, the politics and everything like that, you, your team and your unit didn't have to worry about that. You can just do what you were there to do. And so, again, you know, I, I go through eight different team habits, uh, categories of team habits like belonging and goal setting and prioritization, decision making, meetings, I won't go through all of them. But if we just look us four to eight, again, John, Charlie, Eric, and Taylor, and say, you know what? We consistently set bad goals. Like, we, we're never hitting these things. We can do better with and for each other. Let's mm. really talk about it and change the way. And we don't need management, upper management, to tell us how to do that. We don't need 
upper management to help us come up with a decision matrix for our team that keeps us from running around and wondering how we make a decision. We don't need upper management and senior leadership to direct how we run meetings or how we come together when one of us falls down. Those are all team level things that we can do. And right now, we can do them right now with no additional budget, with no additional personnel, with no additional change in strategy. We can just say, you know what? There are some of these things, what I call broken printers, and we might have to talk about that a little bit, John, but there are some broken printers that make our work life worse that we can fix. Hmm. So how about let's just do that, not ask for permission, so that next time someone hits print, it's not the same old rigmarole and the same old frustration that we had yesterday because one of us or all of us stood up to really make that change happen. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. I mean, um, you know, if you think about, um, you know, highly effective military team, military units, the culture within those units might be unique and different. Right. So they establish their own ways of doing things. Yes, they're still within the context of the Army, the Navy to do certain things. Right. There's certain standards by which we do things. However, the, inside the group, in terms of decision making, priorities, conflict resolution, um, the, the basic, you know, how do we behave as a group? That is typically left up to the team to be able to work that stuff out. And, and so you're saying is like, don't wait, you know, do the things that you have control over, which doesn't take a lot of budget. It just takes sitting down and saying what makes sense for us as a team. You know, those meetings stink. Those hour meetings we're having, why don't we try to do a stand up meeting in 15 minutes as a way to at least connect, but also not waste each other's time. So you're saying is take the initiative and make those changes uh, as necessary, right? To, to, to be, to, to, to basically be more effective in your own group. Absolutely. Like John, I'll give a, an example, very funny, but probably likely example, like that, that sh from our shared military experience, like there's a certain way you, you put like a push broom, like you lean it against the wall. So it doesn't cause injury. You know what I'm talking about? Like there's, you lean it with that way. Right. And that sounds funny, that you can get to that level of a team habit. It's like, no, this is the way that we do it. Because if you invert it, it's always falling and hitting someone or someone stepping on it and it's smacking them in the face. And it sounds funny until you're the person that smacked in the face. And so you can just say, you know what, this is just the way we do things. And we don't need big Navy or big army to tell us which way to turn the broom. We can just look at it and make a good, a good call on it and then roll with it. And I just think there are things like that at the team level, whether it's broken links you know, that we send each other or whether it's, you know, that person on Slack or teams who just can't thread to save their life, right? Everybody else is is writing in the thread That's and then there's, <laughs> there's one random person starts a whole nother thread and doesn't respond to it. It makes everyone's life worse. And it's like, John, come on, man. Like learn how to thread. It's not that hard. It's the same as turning the broom the other way, uh, right? You just smack this all in for it. Right? I, blame, I blame me being Gen X or I'm always out of sight the thread. And someone's like, Just keep it in the thread. I'm like, I'm trying <laughs> really. <am. laughs> Hashtag thread. Like you hold down a little bit longer. That's all it <laughs> takes everybody. But just small things like that. I, I call yeah. them broken printers because in every organization I've ever consulted or worked in, there's been some broken printer that everybody knows is broken, but no one fixes. Mm. Right. It's the one that takes a special paper or the special ink, or you got to have the damn touch code that's never right or whatever it is. It's got that streak down the middle. And inevitably, when things get tight, you'll hit print and it'll go to that printer. And you're like, cool. Until like the big boss is coming in. And then you hand out like the paper that's got the streak down the middle or it's a big customer. Everybody knew the printer was broken. Mm. It's been here so long. It has an employee number. It's like employee number 47. We're now up to 4,000 people and this printer is still here, right? And the question, the paradox of that, that got me started writing about team habits is like, why don't we fix that? Yeah. Right? Because it's, let's get real. It's a $500 decision that someone can make in 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's not the paradox. The paradox is we can't figure out how to make the money or the decision around that. But we can call a team meeting instantly mm. without an approval, without any sort of sense of how much it costs and spend thousands of team dollars talking about nothing or spending thousands of team dollars just figuring out what we should be talking about. 
So on the one hand, we can't fix the printer. That's an easy fix. But we can do this thing that costs a lot of time, energy, attention, and money. What's that about? Right. And so the book sort of unpacks that. But I really want team level conversations around those broken printers. Because it turns out work doesn't have to suck. Work, you don't have to go in every day and have the same damn printer doing the same damn thing, right? John can figure out how to do threads. He might need some team support, (laughs) right? Um, But whatever that is, the way the team makes decisions or doesn't make decisions, that is a fixable thing. And so I want every listener is thinking about it. And you know what your broken printers are, listener. You really do. To really get down and say, okay, what are those things? And what's it going to take it? What's it going to take us to address and fix them? P.S. It's probably not your team leader or your manager who is going to fix them. They got other issues that they're thinking about. That's why the broken printer stays there that long. But, you know, if John was the boss and we had this stinking broken printer, maybe Charlie could be like, hey, John, this printer's broken, has been this way a long time. You, you down with me just figuring out how to fix that and, and get rid of it? I have learned in the executive coaching that I do and the team coaching that I do that there are plenty of leaders and managers that would love for teammates who are not leaders and managers to step up and change some of these things. What they don't love is all of the team problems being their job to fix, right? Um, Because so many of the things we talk about in team habits is really how to be collaborative adults with each other. And there are plenty of leaders and managers that are like, wait, John and Charlie are having a spat and they brought me in to mediate it when really they can just sit down and have an adult conversation with each other and figure it out on their own. Like I'm trying to get these fools paid and they want me to come in and mediate that like John's not threading and is hurting Charlie's feelings and things like that. Like John, Charlie, figure it out, please. Hmm. Right. And I think there's far more room for possibility and change that happens when we as teams accept that we can just fix some things and learn how to do that versus waiting on someone else to do it for us. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. As a leader, you're responsible for the mission and the people assigned to you. Regardless of the size of your team, employees are depending on you for their lives and careers. For the sake of your team and the people who entrust you with this role, you need to master the skills to become a great leader. Best-selling leadership author John Rennie is proud to introduce the Qualified Leadership Book Series. This new series teaches you how to become a people-centered leader. Great leaders know that employees who are respected, appreciated, and allowed to grow will go the extra mile. These books provide real-world leadership wisdom written from a hands-on perspective. If you want to be a more effective leader, this is the one book series you should read this year. This three-book series contains the following best-selling leadership books. I Have the Watch, You Have the Watch, and All in the Same Boat for one low price of $39.99. Begin your journey to become a leader worth following. Go to johnsrenny.com and get your order in today. This episode is brought to you by Leader Connect, a leadership training company and video platform founded by the leadership book author and deep leadership podcast guest, Neil Jurd. Leader Connect is a video and podcast streaming platform for leaders and teams. Watch it alone or as a team, and each video supports you and your team, allowing you to improve performance and build a great culture. Join hundreds of experts and learn about leadership, planning, public speaking, team building, mindfulness, and a range of other subjects that will help you lead well and build a great team. I'm proud to say that I'm one of the experts on this platform. Leader Connect is offering a 10% discount to all deep leadership listeners. Go to leader-connect.co.uk and enter the code DEEP at checkout. Master your leadership 
with Leader Connect. This episode is brought to you by Ignite Management Services. Ignite is led by Mike Watson, who you might remember from episode 137. Mike and his team believe that everything starts with leadership, whether it's strategy execution or cultural transformation. It's the role of the leader to create the conditions for their people to succeed. The team at Ignite can help you develop critical habits to enhance your leadership capability and transform your business. Ignite Management is now offering the Resilient Leadership Assessment Tool. This is an online questionnaire designed to assess and guide leadership development, coaching, and team building. It provides leaders an opportunity to gain insights into their leadership strengths and development needs. After taking this assessment, you will receive a custom detailed report that provides practical and actionable recommendations to enhance your effectiveness. I have taken this assessment myself and found it to be extremely valuable in helping me make changes to my leadership approach. Right now, Ignite is offering 15% off the price of this tool to the deep leadership audience. Go to ignitemanagement.ca and enter the code START15 at checkout to get started today. What are some examples of, of the right kind of team habits? The, the, the habits, like you mentioned, sort of taking initiative would be one of them, right? Uh, working things out amongst their yourself, not waiting on management, obviously. What are some other uh, the, the habits that uh, really would make a big difference? I'll give one. This is in decision making, which is one of my go-to, which is to establish the three levels of decisions that your team can make. So level one decisions are decisions that individuals can make and they don't need to tell anybody. It's just them doing their job, right? Level two decisions are decisions a teammate can make or an action they can take, but they need to tell someone. They need to tell either the rest of the team or they need to tell their manager. Level three decisions are decisions or actions they can't take or make, and they need to defer to management or to the team to figure it out. Okay, simple framework. But when you look at how much team chatter is really either over communicating about level one stuff. People are like, why are you telling me about this? Why do I need to read the CC thread from hell? That's basically you telling me about the about stuff that's related to your job. Or people really not knowing what the level three decisions are around them and being stuck and having to go and find each and every person to figure out what that is. So instead of doing that, we can just create in our team a matrix around that. So John, here are your level one decisions based upon your role, based upon where you sit in the organization. Here's what you can make on your own. Here are the level two, here are the level three. Like the manager or team leader can lead that, but it turns out that we can lead that together. Like I, Charlie could ask John, hey, John, what do you think your level one decisions are? What do you think your level two, what do you think your level three are? Like, oh, that's interesting. Here are mine. And we can figure that out with each other and just clear up some of the muck of working with each other. Another one, this comes from the the chapter on core team habits is what I call shoot, move, communicate, right? So um, it's very much a military acronym. So if you're in the army, shooting actually means shooting a rifle, right? You shoot, you move forward, you take a different position, and then you communicate what you've done. I'm here. Here's what I've done. Well, there's a civilian version of that too. Like you take an action, you take that shot, you move the ball forward. You tell people where you are because in the world where where hybrid teams are the standard, people don't know where you are unless you tell them, right? So you move, you take that shot, it moves you forward and you tell the team, hey, here's where I am. Here's what's next. So that way, if Charlie's made that action, John knows where Charlie is and can make a coordinated action or at least not go through the rework of Charlie and John actually working on the same thing at the same time, neither of them knowing that it's working on that. Third one I'll give here is on planning. And it turns out a lot of teams create what I call ghost plans. And that's where John and Charlie come over and they like have a planning session, but they don't include Eric and Taylor. John and Charlie have a really good idea of what's going on. There's a plan. But that plan does not exist to Eric and Taylor. They're lost and confused over here doing different sort of things. Or John, Charlie, Eric, and Taylor come together and make a plan. Great. That plan changes, but only John and Charlie know about it. And John and Charlie don't tell Eric and Taylor. So now we're operating on two different plans. So we can just make a team habit of one, when we make a plan, it lives in a place where we can all access it. Two, when we change the plan, 
we change the actual plan that's written that everyone knows where it is, and then let people who weren't there know that the plan has changed. John, you'll, you'll hear that everything that I'm saying probably sounds really simple. Like, and that's why throughout the book, I don't call it, I say it's not rocket science. It's rocket practice. It's not difficult to understand. Very, very difficult to practice consistently. One last one on this one. If I were like work president of the day for the whole world, I'd have a few edicts. One of them is no agenda, no meeting. No agenda, no meeting. So if someone's like, hey, if Charlie's like, hey, John, we need to meet. John can easily say about what? What's the actual agenda? What questions are we trying to solve? Like it is the onus on Charlie who is calling the meeting, which is a claim on John, Eric, and Taylor's time to tell them in advance what that meeting is about. Oh, we need to make a decision about X because that lets people on the team say, hey, I have nothing to do with X. I don't need to be there. Right. But when you don't know what the meeting is and someone just plops a meeting on your calendar, you do what so many teams do, John, which is they get there in the first 10 to 15 minutes is figuring out why they're there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which in the standard hour long meeting gives you at most 45 minutes to figure out what to do with it. And then most teams are not talking about next actions at the end of it. Right. So you show up, spend 15 minutes figuring out why you're there have a sideways conversation because people are still trying to get on board with what the actual agenda was. And then time inevitably runs out and people got to go. And so you wondered what, what are we actually doing from that conversation? That John is fixable. We four could fix that. We four to eight people can fix that. So those are four different sort of team habits that, that we can say as a team, we are not doing that to and with each other anymore. And we can just agree. No agenda, no meeting. Here are our level one, two, and three decisions. If I take an action, I'm going to tell you what that action was so you know where I've moved and how to correspond around that. Very simple. In, in up here, very difficult to practice consistently. Yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying because, I, I mean, I've worked at one company. That's was my last corporate job before I became an entrepreneur and, and started my own manufacturing company because I saw that I spent almost eight hours every day in meetings. And I was a, a high level person that was required to be in different meetings. And there was never an agenda. Uh, there was never a plan. We, but I just sat in meetings, whether it was physical meetings or I'd be on, you know, uh, Zoom calls or audio conferences, but all day long. And, and, and there was never one meeting where there was an agenda. There was one, never one meeting. And it was like, these were, these were standard meetings that, that had to happen every week. And it was because it, this is what we do here. And, and I actually left the company because I felt like, I get paid too much money to sit in meetings all day long. Uh, and it was all these cross-functional and we need you because you're in engineering to do it. But, but I, I, it was just completely frustrating because I feel like, I felt like I had no, I had no control of my own day and my own time. I was just at the whim of so many other people. And so I imagine that many people who are listening to this conversation feel somewhat that they are not in charge of their time. They're just going, getting sucked into meetings that add no value. And I think what you're saying is, is that speak up, you know, speak say up. something about it, work with your team and say, you know what, we have these hour meetings every week and uh, we come in here, we're disorganized. We don't have an agenda. And then we, we never get anything done. And we're, and then we're always rushing at the end. What if we came in with an agenda? What if we made it 30 minutes and, you know, and, and then we could all have 30 minutes more of, you know, taking action. So I do like what you're talking about. Um, you know, my, I'm curious how much you, I mean, what you're doing is what you're talking about is, is, is common sense, right? It's like you said, it's not rocket science. Uh, but why do you think it doesn't get practiced? Why do you think that we do for sort of fall into, oh, I guess that's the way, like, oh, I guess the printer, printer's broken. And so I guess someone will fix it. Why do we sometimes default to, I guess this is just the way we do it. Why don't we stand up and, and, and push back? Um, you know, that is the most, one of the most interesting questions that I've had <laughs> as I've come there, because it's one of those where I've had to realize my own biases and the way that I grew up is that like, if something was broken, you just fixed it. Right. Mm, yeah. And so I grew up that way and then joined the Boy Scouts and then joined the army where it's just like, if something's broken, you fix it. Right. Like how many people need to look at the flat RV, the flat Humvee tire 
before someone who's trained in how to do that, we all are, and says, you know what, how about we fix that, mm. right? Um, and so I think part of it is, um, well, I know where we are in our show's timing, and so I'll go there, and then you can decide, John, what we're going to do about it. Let's talk. It's really about power in a, in a way that is sneaky, right? And so it turns out that at work, there are three different dimensions of power but we only talk about two mm. most of the time. So let's get into it. The first dimension that we know a lot about is personal power. And that's what John and Charlie and Eric Taylor can do with their own sort of expertise and knowledge and capabilities. Then on the other side, we have institutional power. So personal power is power to, right? Power to do things. Whereas institutional power is power over. You typically have power over you know, budgets, personnel, people, projects, so on and so forth. So much of our work world oscillates between those two dimensions. So John looks at the printer and goes, well, that's not my job. Charlie looks at the printer and says, well, that's not, I don't have power to fix that. That's not in my job scope, right? We'll let the manager do it, right? The manager or leader is so overwhelmed and it's not necessarily in their job scope to fix the printer. So it stays broken. What it, mix, what it misses is this very powerful in-between dimension of interpersonal power, and that's power with. That's what John, Charlie, Taylor, and Eric can do together that they can't do separately. So it's the power of we, right? Because we might look at the printer as a team and be like, you know what? It's a problem for all of us. It's not a job that any one of us has to do. But one of us could do, or we can all get together and fix that problem, right? So I think it's just a, an imagination gap of seeing the printer and placing fixing it on somebody else's, like somebody else should fix that. IT or the manager, or maybe, you know, Taylor is going to fix it versus saying, you know what, that thing, that broken printer is both my problem, but I think it's my team's problem too. And I want to take better care of myself and us. And I'm going to get curious and figure out why it exists. Like, maybe there's something I don't know, but it could just be that, frankly, we've all gotten lazy and just accepted the absurdity of the normal, right? And, you know, regardless of how much that normal makes our work life suck, makes us want to quit and find another job, we're just going to accept that it's the way it is. But to your point, to that very useful case that you gave, John, someone could have had a peer-to-peer conversation with another person that they've been on all these meetings with and said, hey, Evan, are those meetings working for you? And Evan been like, nah, <laughs> right? And then you two talk to Ann and Ann's like, no, right? And you find enough people that you can say, hey, we're going to try something, right? We're going to cut this meeting down or we notice that we have the same conversations every week. They're not random. So how about we just make a standing agenda and we go through that and we discuss those. Oh, the standing agenda is just updates. Hmm. We don't have to meet and hijack eight people's time to give updates. We can send the email. We can send the slide that just updates that. And we can count on each other to do that work independent, independently and not use each other as some forcing function to do work that we can do on our own. That's what we can do together. So to your point, I think it's one, people don't know how to do it. People don't know that it's possible. People think that their work pain is unique to them versus thinking like, damn, I stand here on this corner and I've watched six people step on that broom and it's whacked everybody in the head. We can just turn it the other way and nobody gets whacked in the head. Right? Um, it's not, I, I wish it were more, I wish it required a PhD to understand, but it really is that simple. And it's like, what's it going to take for us to reclaim our relationships with each other to say, I'm going to take better care of myself and I'm going to take better care of John, Eric and Taylor. And I'm at least going to ask the question of why we're doing this the dumb way. Why are we doing this to harm way? Or is this working for you all? Cause I might be the outlier. And if that's the case, it's a whole different sort of thing. But if you really probe into broken printers, 
you realize you're not the outlier. This is a pain point that everyone has, that it's no one's job to fix, but making everyone's job worse. Do something about it. I love that. I love that. Um, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners about this idea of team habits? Instead of looking at individuals as the thing to be fixed, look at your team's habits and the systems in which you work and stand up as a team and solve those. And you might find that the people on your team are actually just fine. It's the system and the broken printers that were in the way. I love that. Such great advice. Such powerful, common sense uh, advice. Uh, don't just keep walking by that broken printer every day. Don't just say it's on someone else's fault. Why not uh, work together as a team and fix those broken printers that you have in your teams? I love, I love that. Such a simple message, but such an important message. Uh, and I'm glad that, uh, Charlie, you, you could bring that to us today. How can our listeners find out more about you, uh, this new book, and your company? Well, thanks for having me first, and I hope this has been useful for listeners. Again, not, not hard to understand, but standing up and taking care of yourself and your team is harder to practice. Um, if you're interested in more of the conversation around team habits, you can go to betterteamhabits.com. You can also find the book at every major retailer from, you know, the digital ones to walk into your local bookstore. It's probably on the shelf. And if not, please have them order it. Um, my broader body of work, you can find me at ProductiveFlourishing.com um, in case you want to learn more about, you know, how this applies to individuals and personal productivity as well. Well, that's fantastic, Charlie. We're going to put links in the show notes for all those resources. And again, this is a great book um, in terms of trying to get down to the heart of what it means to be a team, what it means to be a successful team, and what it means to have the right habits as a team. And this is for anyone in your, your company that's in a team and that wants to be more effective. Uh, and, you know, if you are wasting your time in meetings, if you're wasting your time dealing with uh, just problem areas that you just never seem solved, like you talk about the same issues week after week and never get solved, then this is a book for you and your team. <laughs> you need to pick it up, read it. And start fixing those broken printers because I think there's a lot of broken printers. I spent 22 years in corporate, saw a lot of broken printers that never got fixed. And so Charlie speaks the truth <laughs> and I've seen it. So uh, don't uh, just walk by those things, get them fixed. Your life will get better. Your team life will get better and you'll be more productive. Charlie, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing this important message and with our listeners. I appreciate it. John, thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Today is working for me. Do you believe that for yourself? Hey, I'm Pastor Julie, and I want to empower you through encouragement, inviting you to my podcast, Big Truth Encouragement, where I unpack living a faith-filled life. I created my podcast for the ladies, but gentlemen, you'll gain something too. So I invite you to listen to Big Truth Encouragement on Electricast and any platform where you listen to your podcast. Electricast. Have you ever wondered what actually happens in Congress every day? Stay informed on Capitol Hill's daily happenings with a concise, factual summary of the Senate and House of Representatives activities from the previous session, free from bias, on the Congressional Record Daily Digest podcast. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and discover the process from the heart of U.S. politics. The Congressional Record Daily Digest, an electric cast production. Electric acid.